Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on the third and as yet final uh, social network analysis webinar uh, by the UK Data Service. Uh, I'm Dermot MacDonald, uh, a research associate here at the University of Manchester uh, with the Data Service. Uh, and thanks very much again. Uh, today, we're going to focus on some of the core techniques and methods of analysis and measures that we can apply to social network uh, data. So some of you have probably joined us before, and thank you very much. Uh, you'll have noticed we've been running these series uh, of training events, which are part of what we've been calling our new forms of data uh, training series. Uh, this is probably more accurately described as our computational social science uh, training series. So currently we've got uh, one more coding demonstration. So this is this alive uh, demonstration of how to do text mining in Python. So tomorrow afternoon, we've got the final session with my colleague, Julia Kazmaier, uh, tomorrow. Uh, and we've got some past webinars that you can view the recording and uh, use all of the other training materials that we provide also. Um, so we have the previous two social network analysis uh, webinars um, and some of Julia's uh, previous text mining uh, webinars also. But if you go to the UK Data Service uh, events page, you can look at the past events uh, and you can gain access to all of those training resources uh, for free. But today we're going to focus on uh, probably what we're all most interested in when it comes to any form uh, of social inquiry, the analysis. So very quickly for just two or three minutes, we'll uh, do a refresher of what we mean by social network analysis. Uh, just so we're all on the same page when we start implementing some of the methods and measures uh, through a live uh, coding demonstration uh, shortly. So we'll focus on analyzing social network data. Uh, so we're not going to focus on analyzing social media uh, data, even though that data is itself structured uh, as a network. Um, but the techniques and the measures we cover can be applied to any data set that captures the connections or the relational um, attributes uh, of a group of people, a group of organizations, uh, or any set of units of analysis. And we look at the analysis from two perspectives. We look at describing the network overall, so that what network is formed uh, by entities and the connections, and um, that network has properties, and can we measure some of those properties? Some obvious ones would include the you know, size of the network, you know, how many connections exist, and um, plus we look at some more uh, intermediate uh, level analysis also. And we can also approach it from the perspective of the nodes. So the nodes are the entities that exist in a network, and we can look at describing the nodes uh, that form um, our network. So we can look at how central, how important some nodes are. We can look at whether no nodes play particular roles, whether some are brokers, some act as hubs within the network, uh, and whether some nodes are positioned closer um, and you know, occupy a strategic position uh, in the network uh, also. So that will all uh, form a kind of live coding demonstration where we can take our time working through the measures and I'll show you how you can um, implement those measures using Python uh, and a social network analysis package in that language. Uh, and that will come out, we'll take some, some questions and I'll point you again to some further learning and resources. I'll address this more at the end, um, but while this is the final webinar in our social network analysis uh, webinar series, that doesn't mean it's the end of our training provision when it comes to social network analysis. So at the end, if you have some questions and when we send you the feedback form, um, it would be good if you could say, you know, what further training you would like to see, whether it's relating to social network analysis or the Python programming language, or maybe you wanna see the same material but convert it into the R programming language, uh, for example. So please uh, be as honest and as forthright as you want at the end, uh, and we'll do our best to develop some new training materials. So very quickly, why this uh, training series? If you're here for the previous two, you'll know <clears throat> uh, why we're doing this training uh, series. Social network analysis you know, offers um, a lot of potential to social researchers. It's an incredibly rich uh, methodological approach. Um, a lot of our online lives especially, but even some of our offline lives are really characterized by our relationships and the patterns uh, that these relationships form at an aggregate level. The problem is social network analysis uh, derives itself from uh, graph theory, uh, which is a, a branch of mathematics, um, which itself uh, informed network theory, which then informed social network. Uh, 
analysis and theory. Therefore, what it means is social network analysis is quite a technical and mathematical and abstract um, approach, methodological approach. So while it has a lot of concepts that do map uh, to sociological phenomena and concepts of interest, the language used is very technical, it can be very off-putting. Um, so our intention with this training series is to demystify and to clarify uh, some of these uh, technical terms uh, and algorithms. So a very quick refresher on what we mean uh, by social network analysis. So as I alluded to, it's a methodological um, and a conceptual uh, toolbox. So it's a very broad and rich uh, methodological approach. And it allows you to measure and to describe and to analyze patterns uh, in relational structures in the social world. In essence, people form connections. Those connections then aggregate up and form networks that we can analyze. And of course, it's not just people. So despite the name social network analysis, you may be interested in how organizations um, are connected. I've seen some really good studies that we'll reference later that looked at animal networks, uh, food sharing networks uh, among jackdaw crows, for example, is a really um, very instructive, uh, surprisingly instructive example of social network um, analysis. So this allows us to measure and describe and analyze uh, connections and patterns in the social world. A relation itself is a distinctive type of connection or tie that exists between uh, two entities. We're probably all uh, thankfully familiar with familial connections. Siblings share a, a familial connection, parents and children, cousins, uncles and aunts, uh, etc. But of course, we can be connected in so many other ways. We can be colleagues, we can be gym buddies, we can be um, you know, flatmates, we can be uh, spouses, uh, and whatever else you can think of really with your uh, imagination. So relation is just a distinctive type of connection that forms uh, between uh, two entities. And thus, those relations become the building blocks um, of networks. So a network really is an aggregation of all those patterns of connections to form so some sort of overall coherent uh, network. And social network analysis uh, thus is concerned with and most appropriate um, for data that captures these relations uh, between units uh, of analysis. So we can, in previous uh, webinars, we looked at you know, Twitter data, which you know, by default um, is structured uh, as network data. By that, I mean tweets are liked by different people, tweets are shared by other people, and um, I can follow other people's accounts on Twitter. So you know, the very nature of the interactions on the Twitter platform give rise to network data. But as we'll see in this example today, and previous examples I showed you, um, traditional data, administrative data, social survey data will contain information on how units of analysis are connected, and we can restructure that data so that it looks like a network, and then we can analyze it using social network um, analysis. Again, that's best demonstrated, uh, which we'll do so in a couple of moments. So to keep these kind of key terms and concepts in your head as we progress, um, a network is constructed from two main building blocks. So there are the entities that are or could be connected uh, in a network. So these are the people, the organizations, the animals, the countries, the places, um, whoever the units of analysis are in your study, and the connections that exist or could exist uh, between these entities. So in a very simple way, um, we can describe networks using two uh, building blocks. And a network then is an aggregation or a collection of these entities uh, and the connections that are formed uh, between them. Very simple example, a family tree is a type of network. Uh, it contains individuals who are our entities. And these individuals are related through some type of familial uh, tie, so some type of uh, connection. This is a real social network that we looked at uh, in the first webinar. It's from my own research area of charitable organizations. Uh, and these are Manchester-based uh, uh, charities. Uh, and these are all the connections that exist uh, between them. So I won't go into, uh, we won't be analyzing this network in particular, but something reasonably similar to do with charities. Um, but visualization is an insufficient, but it's, it's an interesting first step uh, in the analysis. So just by even looking at this, we can see that there's a central cluster or uh, aggregation of, of charities that are densely connected. And then we have some on the outside who only have one or two connections to other organizations. 
So let's get stuck uh, straight into some of the uh, analysis. So what we have here is, uh, if you've joined us before, something called a Jupyter uh, Notebook. Uh, a Jupyter Notebook is basically, um, it's like a Word document, if you want to think of it that way, but the document can contain more than just the narrative, it contains code and it contains the uh, output associated um, with some code also. Uh, and I find them quite a useful uh, computational tool. So for a lot of my research, I use um, Stata, the um, you know, social science statistical uh, software package. Um, you can you know, have a Jupyter notebook which contains Stata code, you can have a Jupyter notebook as we'll see today, which contains uh, Python code, it can contain R code, Julia, and there's lots of other uh, languages. Uh, but that's just so you have a little bit of context um, of what we're going to do uh, today. So the first thing we need to do to set up um, you know, our notebook in Python for our analysis uh, is we need to load in the packages uh, that we uh, need. So I won't go through this, but at a later date, if you'd like, we can have um, a coding demonstration where we actually go through the meaning of each of these lines. But in general, what I'm doing is I'm just loading in all the different methods and functions that I need uh, to analyze uh, network uh, data. So I'll do that. So I'll load in all the packages uh, that I need, and I will load in uh, the data that I need. So here's an example of some um, funding organizations uh, in the UK and the network that forms uh, between them. So here on the uh, X are the um, rows here, we have different organizations. Uh, so these will be individual funders. So one of these will be children in need, for example. Uh, there'll be the um, Lloyd's TSB Foundation. So the banking organization has a foundation that um, provides funding to charitable organizations. Uh, the Big Lottery will be one of these funders, um, et cetera. And we have the same set of organizations uh, along the top here as a column. And then basically each cell in this data set indicates whether these funders are connected uh, to each other. So for example, this funder here and this funder here um, both fund the same four organizations. So each funder might fund a couple of hundred of organizations each, but there are four uh, in particular that they both provided uh, funding uh, to. This same organization here has funded 35 of the same charities as this funder uh, here, for example. I will dip into the data a bit more when we produce the analysis. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, a sense of um, what the data uh, entails. Uh, this is open data, so the, the underlying data set um, from which I created this network data is available on the GitHub repository, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, so you could recreate this analysis yourself, um, or you could extend it and do, do what you uh, like with it. But basically this data set contains all of the organizations funded by about 83 different funders in response to COVID-19. So there's lots of charitable organizations in the UK who, thanks to the public health emergency, um, have been targeted with funding by these 83 funders. And these funders are connected if they fund at least one of the same uh, organizations. So there's at least one organization in common that they've both provided funding uh, to. So what we do is we load in that data into uh, Python, into the uh, networks um, uh, network analysis uh, package. And the first simple thing we want to do before we dive into um, specific measures and methods of analysis is we just want to get a sense of the uh, number of nodes in the network, uh, i.e. the number of funders, and we want a sense of the number of edges, i.e. the number of connections or ties uh, in the network. Uh, so we can run the code here. Uh, previous results um, were there already, as you could see. So we have a network containing 83 nodes. Um, there are 640 uh, connections between these nodes. Uh, and on average, um, a funder is connected to about 15 other funder organizations. So that seems like quite a lot, but when you consider that there are 83 funders and there's about 10 or 11,000 different organizations uh, that have been funded, there's gonna be some you know, overlap uh, between uh, who they funded. So you can see that already just from such simple uh, measures, we can get a sense of, well, 
either all of these funders have 15 uh, connections or there's maybe a couple of funders who are connected to lots of others and then there's a larger group number of funders who don't have any connections um, at all and we're going to explore that um, as we progress uh, through the analysis. So let's first look at the network level measures. So what kind of properties does our network of funders have um, and how can we uh, analyze and describe these properties? The first thing we'll do is we'll just get a, a quick you know, overview of what the network looks like. So we produce a network visualization. You may have heard these referred to as sociograms in social network analysis um, or just network visualizations or network graphs. Um, there's lots of different terms um, for them. So make that a little bit uh, smaller. Excellent. So the first thing we can do is we can say we want uh, you know, a random layout um, of this um, network. So here's how it looks like. So we can see that all of these circles, uh, our dots represent the nodes in the network and the lines uh, represent the edges or the connections uh, between these nodes. So visualizing is um, often a, an insufficient and it's often unnecessary, frankly, uh, when it comes to analyzing networks. But you can produce one um, at the exploratory uh, stage and we can still learn a couple of a couple of interesting things. So for example, we can see that there are at least one, two, uh, three funders who have no connections whatsoever uh, in the network. You can see that there are no lines coming to or from uh, three of these nodes uh, so far. So at least that tells us, okay, there are some funders who didn't fund the same organizations as any of the other uh, funders in the network. So we would call these isolates. So these are isolated uh, nodes. And we can also get a sense that there are a couple of nodes who are really um, densely connected. So we can see lots of lines going in all sorts of directions from this node um, here. And we can see that there are some that have been positioned on the periphery of the network, which have one, two, three, yeah, maybe three or four connections uh, as well. So we can see when we had our average measure previously of 15 connections between uh, for each individual funder, we can see that that's you know uh, quite heavily skewed by a small number of organizations who have lots of connections uh, and a much larger group of organizations who have very few or none, uh, no connections uh, at all. To highlight why visualization can, act, can be quite unrevealing uh, and unnecessary is this is the exact same network, um, just, just represented using a different um, algorithm. So the previous one was what's known as a, a random layout. Um, in the network's Python package, we can say we want a spring layout. And you can see that this, again, shows us some of the isolates. Um, but you know the scaling is quite off. It's quite difficult to you know to distinguish what's going on in this clump uh, here. Uh, we can use what's called the Kamada Kawai layout as well to look at the network. This seems like somewhat of an improvement over the random layout, but again, it's it's not telling us very much that we didn't already uh, know. And there are four or five, um, if not more. Um, visualization uh, algorithms that you can use in the networks package. So hopefully that conveys just how um, unrevealing visualizing. So I'm sure we've all seen some excellent um, you know, infographics containing network visualizations and they can be quite good as public communication tools. But for the hard graft of understanding the properties of a network, um, visualization is really insufficient um, and is really unnecessary uh, in lots of cases. So the first bit of analysis we want to do is get a sense of the size of the network. And we saw some of these um, figures um, already. Make that touch bigger. So we can get the same information again. We can get the basic information. Our network has 83 nodes, 640 edges or connections. Uh, and on average, uh, a funder is connected to 15 other funder organizations. But that's just a really um, basic uh, stepping stone to more uh, interesting measures of analysis. So the next thing we're going to look at is what's called the degree distribution. So this basically shows a histogram uh, of all the different connections in the network. So as I said, we can clearly see that some funders had lots of connections, you know, dozens of connections. Some funders had none and a lot of funders had, you know, two or three or four or five uh, different uh, connections. So we can plot uh, the degree distribution 
um, which gives us a sense of uh, the distribution of degrees in the network. So it's called degree. Uh, what that basically means is connections or ties or edges. It's just a different uh, word for it. So we can see here in our visualization uh, that a very, um, well, let's say we'll start on this end. So a very small number of funders, so about two or three funders um, have between 50 and 60 connections. So there are a very, very small number of funders in our network um, who are intensely or very, you know, um, considerably connected to other organizations. But typically what we see is, you know, the vast majority of funders have, you know, fewer than 20 connections. And that's still a lot, I think, for a real world, you know, social network to have so many um, ties or connections uh, in the network. Um, but again, you can see that there are about, you know, 26, 27 uh, organizations who have, you know, one connection. So again, we can see that, you know, the distribution is, is heavily skewed. Very small number have a lot of connections and most have, you know, reasonably uh, few uh, connections. We can get a sense then of how many isolates or how many nodes that have no connections uh, exist um, in the network. Uh, by calling on the uh, number of isolates uh, method in the networks package. So there are eight. So there are eight funders in the network who are not connected uh, to anybody um, else. So that leaves us with 75 funders uh, who share some connections uh, between um, each other. The next thing we wanna look at in terms of the network is its uh, density. So what we're doing here is we know how many connections exist in total. There are 600 and something connections. We've then looked at how those connections are distributed. A very small number have lots of connections. Most have, you know, few or, or none, no connections. Uh, now we want to take that information and produce a summary statistic known as the density of the network. So the question we're asking here is how cohesive or how dense is this network? Put another way, how many of the possible connections that could exist in this network have actually been realized? So there's lots of nodes. These nodes could all be connected to each other. It could be a fully you know, saturated network where every funder is connected to every other funder. That's unrealistic. So we want a sense of compared to that picture, how many connections uh, did we actually see um, realized? So again, uh, the networks package is very concise. This is really good. It's a good feature of this Python package. We just call on the uh, density function uh, and it gives us our summary statistic. So we can see that the network density um, statistic gives us a figure of 0.19. Uh, if we round it to two decimal places, we can interpret that as about 19% of all possible connections that could be formed in the network have actually been uh, realized. And again, you'll probably um, agree with me that that's quite a lot for what some real world um, data. So funders, uh, this gives an idea of the fact that what's probably happening is funders are deliberately targeting the same organizations. And again, that makes sense. It's a COVID-19 response fund. Uh, it's a program to support certain organizations. So we would expect to see some overlap. So multiple funders and providing grants to the same uh, organization. So again, density is a really good uh, overall summary. It tells us of all of all the possible connections that could exist and um, how many have actually uh, come uh, to pass. Taking the same uh, you know, uh, information again, what we want to do is have a look at how clustered the network is. So we know there's lots of connections and we know what proportion of those connections um, uh, have actually been realized. Um, now we want to get a sense of to what extent are nodes in the network clustered together. So put another way, what we want to say is, do we see groups of funders coming together? So is our network characterized by, you know, um, pairs of, of funders, you know, connecting to each other, but there's never more than two funders connected, okay? So we don't see any triangles uh, or quadrangles or anything like that. Um, if a connection exists, it's between two funders uh, and that's as far as it goes. So we can get a sense of how clustered the network is using something called the uh, transitivity um, measure. So to give you a sense of what we mean by transitivity, um, 
as I said previously, uh, your network could be characterized by you know, lots of connections between pairs of nodes. So here we have um, a, a kind of a fictional example here. We have uh, three nodes uh, and we can see that two connections exist uh, between these three nodes. But what's missing is a connection between these two here. So if that connection was realized, we would see what's known as a, a triad in the network. So a, a trio of nodes um, who are all connected uh, to each other. So the clustering measure that we're going to um, uh, produce just now gives us a sense of the probability that when we see this situation here, that this happens next. So if, two, if there's a group of funders and there's connections between some of them, What's the probability that they then say, oh, actually, there's one connection missing, let's form uh, that connection. So that's what our transitivity uh, measure gives us. Uh, it gives us an idea of how clustered are the probability of groups forming um, in our network. And it specifically uh, relates to uh, triads. So groups of three nodes, uh, what's the probability of closing, you know, of forming a triangle, of closing uh, those connections? So you can see our, our transitivity measure, um, our clustering measure is, is quite high. It's at 0 0.49 if we round it again. What this means is 49% of possible triads have been uh, realized. So I'll just go back again. So when we see this situation here, 49% uh, of the time, this is what happens. So essentially half of the time we see triangles formed um, when we have this situation uh, just uh, here. So again, that's, that's, that's quite high, um, but as I said previously, this is quite a targeted uh, package of support. Um, again, you know, if, if two funders are, are supporting an organization, um, there's a reasonable likelihood that the third one um, would also come in and also uh, support that organization. So we can see already that our network is, you know, is quite, you know, dense. There's, um, you know, a lot of organizations are getting funding from the same funders. Uh, it's quite an interesting real world network uh, so far. So the next thing we want to do now is if we think back to our visualization of the network, we could kind of get a sense of, you know, if you were to journey from one side of it to the other, how far is that um, journey? So how many, you know, how long would it take you essentially to go from the left hand side of the network to the right hand side? Or from the top to the bottom, um, it's not really important how we orientate ourselves with that. Uh, it's just more important to think, you know, how many steps does it take to go from one side of the network uh, to the other? So diameter, just like in um, uh, mathematics, it's you know, it's what's the what's the length uh, of the network from one end uh, to the other. So we can try and calculate the diameter measure um, for our funder network. And if we do that, in this case, you can see we get um, an error term. So what happens here is if we want to say, well, how far is it from a node on the left-hand side to a node on the furthest right-hand side? The problem arises um, if we have isolates in the network. And we've seen that we have eight. So in graph theory, uh, it's just impossible to calculate how far a node is that's isolated from a node that's connected on the left-hand side. Because if, if a node doesn't have a connection to another, there's no way of getting to that other node. It's infinite, the distance um, that exists uh, between them. So we need a little bit of a workaround when we calculate the diameter uh, of a network. Uh, we need to do something uh, which is basically breaking our network down into a component. Um, and I'll explain what a component is uh, just immediately following this uh, measure. But now that we have um, a component in our network, now we can calculate uh, the diameter. And the figure we get back is four. So what this captures is there's basically four steps um, on the longest journey in the network. So from one end to the other, it takes four steps. So basically that's four connections between a node situated on the outer uh, extreme of the network to a node at the opposite uh, outer extreme of the network. And that's relatively few, okay? So if I'm a node at one end and I wanna you know, get information to a funder who's over the other end of the network, it's gonna take me four steps. Basically, it's gonna take me four other funders to go through to pass the message uh, on. So when you think of diameter, uh, and we're gonna look at this in a little bit more detail in a moment, 
you know, think of six degrees of separation, you know, how far apart are nodes uh, in the network, and basically the furthest distance in the network, so this is the diameter is uh, four. So that's the, basically the longest journey uh, it takes to go from one node uh, to the other. So I just mentioned uh, components uh, in the network uh, when we were measuring the diameter. A component basically is a subset of the network. So it's a subset of nodes, and it's a, it's a particular subset where every node is connected to every other. And now this is either directly or indirectly. And we'll see how that looks uh, in just uh, a moment. Networks in the real world tend to have more than one component. So basically there's, uh, there's a handful, if not more, um, of kind of subgroups within your, within your network who are all connected to each other. The key point with a component is, by definition, it cannot be connected to any other component. Because remember, it's a situation that arises when the, all of the nodes are connected to uh, all of the other nodes in a component. By definition, that means they can't be connected to any other nodes in a different component. So these are kind of subgroups that have no interaction. So if a network has five components, those five components are distinct and there's no connection direct or indirect between those components. They're kind of like islands, if you want to think of it uh, that way. So let's explore how many network um, components there are in our funding uh, network. So we see that there are nine um, different components in our funders uh, network. But this is actually a bit misleading. So this is a little um, thing you need to watch when you use the networks package in Python. Isolates are counted uh, as components when you calculate uh, this measure um, here. So as we saw previously, an isolate is a node with, with no connections. Um, so basically, Python treats that isolate as a component you know, itself. This would make sense in the small number of situations where a node you know, um, can be connected to itself. So there's something called a self-loop in a network. That's where I'm connected to myself um, somehow. Um, I can't think of an example right off the top of my head, but well, if we think of Twitter, if you're familiar with Twitter, um, you can retweet and you can like your own tweets. So actually that's an example of a connection to yourself. So you, you can republish or repost something you've previously uh, written. And if you do that, that obviously makes sense then to say that you're your own distinct uh, component. Um, but in a, m many other situations, it doesn't really make sense to say, well, I'm connected to myself, therefore uh, I form a component. And we can confirm what I've what my suspicion was that really what we have is one large component um, and eight isolates. And you can see here what I've done is I've taken out all of the components in my graph uh, and I've converted them into networks themselves and I printed the same information. Um, and as you can see, uh, there are nine components, uh, but all of them bar one um, identify the isolates. So basically in my network, I have one large component where everybody's connected to everyone else um, and the exception are the eight that have no connections uh, to anybody um, else. So if you want, we can visualize uh, the largest component. Obviously it looks very much like the overall network, except this time you can see there's no isolates. So there's no dot on its own. Uh, without any lines going to it, those have been removed. Um, this is the this is essentially the network. So if you were not interested in any of the isolates, um, this is really the network. We've got 75 funders uh, and the you know 600 and something connections um, that exist. So why it's important to identify components? This is not really an academic. It's actually crucial. As we've seen, a lot of the network analysis measures um, can only be calculated. Uh, using components, because as I said, you know, the, it makes no sense to say what's the distance between an isolated node and one that's connected, you know, over the other side. Um, you know, it's just it's infinity the distance between an unconnected node uh, and uh, another. And there's lots of other measures as well. Um, particularly if you want to make comparisons between networks, um, usually those comparisons are made between the largest components uh, in each uh, network uh, also. <clears throat> 
continuing with our uh, theme um, of breaking our network down into subgroups, um, there's a term which you're probably familiar with in everyday um, language, which is uh, a clique. So a clique is very similar to a component uh, in that it represents a subset of the network. Um, so i.e. it's where every node is connected to every other. But the crucial difference compared to a component is that all of these nodes um, share direct ties. So each node has a direct link to every other node uh, in the clique. While as we saw um, with the components, uh, everybody is connected, but you know there's not the same number of connections. So we can see that this node is connected to this node, but only by going an indirect route, you know, to here first, somewhere here, 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 and then you know uh, it has to make a journey. It's indirectly connected. A clique, on the other hand, would mean that there has to be a direct connection for between these two. Uh, for them to be part uh, of uh, a clique. So again, similar to what we did with components, we can say, right, tell me the number of cliques uh, that exist uh, in the network. And there's quite a number. So there's 251, which is uh, quite a lot, but a clique you know, has a very low uh, barrier to entry, You know, two or three nodes on their own, if they were all connected, like as we saw in a triangle, well, that's a clique, so every node is connected to every other in the triad. So that's an example. Uh, really what a clique is, you know, we want to look, um, we want to look at larger groups of nodes. So are there groups of 10, 12, 15 funders who are all connected to each other? So they all fund uh, the same uh, organizations. So what we'll do is we'll now pick out the uh, largest clique, just like we did for the largest component. Um, and we'll uh, take a look at its summary statistics. So the largest clique, so the largest subset of connected nodes in the network, uh, there are 12, um, there are 66 uh, connections, and the average number of connections is um, 11. And in this case, because it's a clique, that means that each of those 12 nodes has 11 connections. Uh, not that it's an average and it's skewed by some having a lot of connections and some having none. By definition, it wouldn't be a clique unless they were all connected uh, to each other. And I think this is better conveyed um, you know, uh, visually. Um, so as you can see, compared to a component, every single node in the clique is connected to every single other. So there's basically 11 lines going from every single node uh, to each of the others uh, in the clique. And obviously then using the concept of a clique, we can start talking about, you know, that there are certain subgroups in the network, um, you know, who are, you know, uh, a lot more densely connected. We can say then that that's conditions for, you know, uh, very efficient information sharing, or we can say that, you know, that forms a very coherent subgroup. You know, or maybe that's a, a homogenous group of funders. Maybe these uh, twelve funders all target, you know, the relief of poverty or something. You know, there must be some, um, you know, connection linking them. Of course, it could just be as well random chance that we see uh, cliques like this uh, in the network also. So we need to keep that in mind uh, as well. So that's a run through of uh, some of the, the most common, you know, kind of in basic and intermediate uh, network level uh, measures. What if we now focus on the nodes themselves? So we have funders in the network. Can we describe, you know, their properties uh, as they exist in the network? So how connected are individual funders in the network? Um, and we can look at some other um, measures as well of, you know, how far apart are, you know, individual uh, funders, are some, you know, really close to most others, or are some on the outskirts uh, of the network uh, as well. So what we want to talk about first is this idea of, you know, centrality. So, you know, you can interpret this, you know, in a geographic, you know, sense or in, in terms of geometry, you know, there's a center point in the network, you know, there's there's a funder who acts as a hub, who's connected to the vast majority of other funders in the network. Maybe some uh, nodes act as hubs or brokers, uh, you know, uh, facilitating relationships between other uh, funders in the, in the network, um, et cetera. So it's a measure of how important a node is in a network. And there's different ways of measuring centrality. We're going to look at three different uh, measures. So I gave one example, a node may act as a hub. So lots of connections run into that individual node. Uh, some nodes act as brokers. So some 
funders sit in between the relationships uh, of other funders and we'll see how that looks uh, visually as well and some nodes may just be proximate or positioned very closely to most uh, other uh, nodes and being central in a network usually confers a lot of advantages uh, to a given uh, node so there's different measures uh, of centrality so we're going to look at uh, three uh, just now so the first we're going to look at is degree uh, centrality. And remember that when we say degree, we're talking about the number of ties or the number of connections uh, in the network overall. But now that we're talking about nodes, we're talking about the individual number of ties uh, per node. Uh, so for a given funder, you know, does it have one or 10 or 60 connections, for example? And degree centrality is a measure of how popular or how well connected a node is in the network. And it's usually standardized as well, um, because if you had um, a network where there were, you know, thousands of nodes and, a, and an individual node, you know, had 100 connections, you could say, right, well, that's quite important. But if your, <clears throat> excuse me, if your network only had 110 nodes and a given node had 100 <laughs> connections, clearly that one is more central or important. Uh, than a node in a different network with the same number of ties, uh, for example. But you don't need to worry uh, too much about that. Just realize that you know there's some standardization or normalization applied uh, to a lot of these uh, measures. So what we do with our, our Python code is we basically, you know, we capture the number of connections uh, per funder, uh, then we sort them, and I just ask you know Python to print the top uh, 20. So here are the top 20 funders uh, by the number of connections they have. Um, this is the official ID of the, um, natural, uh, the National Lottery Community Fund. So this funder has uh, connections to 61 of the other um, 82 funders in the network. So this is an incredibly well-connected um, funding uh, organization. <clears throat> Uh, the second might be children in need. I'm not quite sure. Uh, you could look all these up um, yourself. The original data set, as I said, is in the data folder uh, in the repository, which I'll show you uh, in a moment. So here we get a sense of who is the most important node in the network. Well, if we use our degree centrality um, uh, calculation, um, we can see that it is the National Lottery Community Fund. But as you've noticed, this is the, the raw measure of the number of degrees. Um, degree centrality, as I said, is, is, is normalized. It's calculated uh, a little bit um, uh, differently. Um, but we still get the uh, same ordering uh, of results. So the degree centrality measure here is 0.74. Um, so again, the best connected or the most important or the most popular node in the network is this one here, which again is the National Lottery Community uh, Fund. And conceptually, the uh, best connected nodes um, in a network can be considered as hubs. So you can consider them as the most popular, but you can also consider them as hubs where all of the, you know, where a vast number of the connections run in or run through um, a given uh, node. There's a different measure of centrality, which we um, alluded to recently, which was this idea of um, brokerage in a network. So this is the idea of whether <clears throat> there's a node in the network that facilitates indirect connections between other um, nodes. So we know this National Lottery Community Fund is the best connected, but does it also sit in the middle of all the other connections that exist um, between funders in the network um, as well? So let's consider a very simple example before we calculate the measure um, itself. Uh, here we have a very uh, simple, you know, three node network. We've got, you know, three individuals here, um, Josie, Jane, and John. In this network, Jane acts as the broker. So if Jane wasn't in this network, these lines here wouldn't continue. These lines wouldn't exist. So there's no direct line between John and Josie. So if Jane didn't exist or removed from the network, um, this indirect connection here would disappear. So this is a very simple example of how Jane acts as a broker uh, in uh, the network. So we can apply the same idea again to the funders network and we can say, you know, what are the top 20 broker nodes uh, in the network? And probably unsurprisingly, there's a lot of uh, consistency between the um, degree centrality measure and the betweenness centrality measure. 
where again we see um, the National uh, Lottery Community Fund is uh, has the highest betweenness centrality score, which again, basically it's the proportion of times uh, that the lottery funder um, sits in the middle of these direct ties. So if you swap out Jane with the National Lottery, it's the proportion of times you see the National Lottery in this role um, here. So there's a lot of coherence. We can see that basically the ordering um, of funders in the network by the between a centrality measure is, is much the same uh, as the degree centrality measure um, also. So again, so we've spoken about who is the best connected, the most popular um, node in the network. Now we've seen the one that acts as a broker, the one that kind of facilitates the indirect ties that exist uh, in the network. Um, and this is related to something you've probably heard before, which is this concept of a structural um, hole. So this is a scenario again, where there's a, a lack of direct contact or a tie between uh, two entities. And therefore a broker can fill this gap and uh, ensure a connection forms between two uh, nodes. Again, I've just I've just kind of um, referenced it a moment ago. You know what would happen if Jane right here? Uh, what would happen if she disappeared? If she disappeared, there would be a structural hole between these two nodes um, here. So again, we can um, ask Python to calculate the uh, structural hole uh, constraint uh, measure. And again, this just tells us. Um, uh, which organizations you know um, act as a as as a broker so basically if this organization here was taking out of the network we would see quite a few indirect ties uh, dis disappear so again it, it's it's a related idea it's almost the um, it's almost the inverse of what we were talking about with uh, between a centrality um, you know this is where we see uh, the potential for structural holes uh, to occur. So again, if you were to remove these organizations, uh, what would happen? You know, we'd see lots of ties uh, disappear uh, in the network. And our final measure of um, centrality is known as um, closeness. And this captures the idea of proximity uh, in a network. So basically, is there a node in the network that's situated to most of the others? So basically, there are very few steps from one node to you know, a set of other uh, nodes. If one node is very proximate or very close to many others, then it occupies you know, a strategic uh, position in the network because that node will have a lot of influence over, over the nodes it's connected to um, and it allows it to diffuse knowledge or materials or resources uh, throughout the network uh, very easily. You know, taking a simple example, if you had one node, you know, that was at most, you know, two steps away from the majority of other nodes, and then you had a node that was, you know, on average five steps away, uh, you know, that would be less close than the node that is on average two steps away, because that node in just two steps, you know, like a friend of a friend can get information or materials or resources uh, to those nodes a lot easier uh, than the other one. And again, you can see there's there's thankfully a lot of um, similarities in both in terms of how we're uh, calculating the different centrality scores and you know what they actually um, uh, mean. So again, uh, unsurprisingly, the the National Lottery Community Fund is also um, you know closest to most other nodes in the network. Again, that means you know it's in a position to again diffuse or to spread um, resources to a lot of other um, organizations also. Uh, but there's two others as well that that fulfill this role uh, again so basically there's there's a high degree of consistency in our, in our network between the best connected funders which we measure using degree centrality and um, those nodes that have greater potential for brokering connections uh, which is our betweenness centrality measure uh, and the nodes that are most proximate are you know situated um, very close to uh, lots of other nodes, uh, which is our closeness uh, centrality measure um, also. So the final thing we're going to um, look at as part of our node level um, analysis, and it's the last thing we'll do in general, uh, is this idea of distance. And we saw one measure um, earlier when we looked at the network overall, we looked at the diameter. So what's the kind of the furthest distance um, between you know a node on one side of the network and a node uh, on the other side, um, you know we can now uh, calculate this measure basically for 
uh, individual nodes um, themselves. So for a given node, how far away is it from every other node uh, in the network? And distance measures basically gives a sense of how reachable um, a given uh, node is. So again, if we think back to nodes that share a direct tie, so if there's a line drawn between two nodes, uh, we can say they're separated by a distance of one. So there's one step between those two nodes. If there are two nodes uh, that possess an indirect tie, then they're separated by a distance of two or more. Um, so this is again the idea of a friend of a friend. You're separated by a distance of two. You know, it takes you two steps to go from you to your friend who then transfers the information to their friend. And of course you can have distances of three or four or five, um, et cetera. So the measure of distance we're gonna look at is something called the geodesic uh, distance. So basically this represents the shortest or optimal or most efficient uh, path between two uh, nodes in the network. So basically it's the it's the shortest distance, it's the shortest number of steps that exist uh, between any given pair of nodes uh, in the network. So the distance uh, we can say you know what uh, what a path actually looks like between uh, two nodes. So if we consider a starting point um, up here, so this is um, let's say that's a funder in our network uh, and this is a funder uh, that uh, we want to uh, reach. Uh, then we can say, right, well, this funder needs to go here. So that's step one, step two, step three, four, five, six, seven. So we can see that the distance, the geodesic distance between this node here and this one here uh, is uh, seven. There are also um, lots of other ways of getting to that node, you know, not in this example, but let's say, uh, this node was connected to this one, and this one was connected back again. So you could say, we go from here, and then we go here, and we go back around and back around, et cetera. And that's obviously adding extra steps. So we're not in interested in all the different ways you can get between two nodes. We're interested in the quickest, shortest number of steps uh, between a pair of nodes um, in the network. So we can see if we were interested in uh, two particular nodes, so let's say this is one funder, and it is, this is one funder in our network, and um, here is another, and um, here are all the different ways you can get between them. So there's no direct line between the two of them, and um, so there's, there, there's no distance one between them, so they're separated by um, at least uh, two steps or more. And um, we're gonna calculate what it is exactly in just a moment, but you can kind of get a sense visually of the number of steps. So this funder here has about five or six different connections. So you could take this path to here and then maybe to here and here and here and then out, etc. But in all those different configurations, all those different journeys, there's gonna be the shortest, most efficient uh, path uh, between them. Uh, and here it is. So we can ask the networks to calculate uh, the most efficient uh, path between this funder here and this one uh, here. And here's the path actually written out. So we start with this person, uh, well, this organization, and then we need to go to this one, then to this one, and finally we reach our destination um, here. And as you probably noticed, I don't even need to actually calculate um, the, the geodesic distance. We know that the shortest path is you know, three. So step one, step two, uh, step three. While that is the shortest path, there's actually multiple ways uh, of doing that. So there's multiple shortest paths between those two uh, nodes. So for example, again, here are our source and target funders. So you can go to this one second and this one third, or you could go to this one second and this one again, et cetera. So um, there's basically eight ways of going between these two nodes uh, that we can consider the most efficient uh, way. But just in case you didn't believe me or just by looking at it visually, you can actually ask it to calculate what's the, the length of the shortest uh, path. So the yeah, geodesic distance between these two uh, nodes is uh, three. So we're not, well, I was gonna cover this, but actually I'm gonna take uh, questions instead because I see we're coming up uh, to the uh, end. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of techniques uh, that you've probably heard such as exponential random graph models, um, stochastic actor oriented models, uh, relational event models, um, etc. Um, in this notebook, 
notebook that I've put together. Um, we'll be sharing the link with you, uh, and I'll show you just now actually as well where the link is. Um, there's a bit of material on what uh, one of these advanced approaches uh, is. It gives you a look at some data uh, and a paper that kind of explains um, what's going on. But as I said at the beginning, uh, if you are interested in um, more advanced you know, statistical modeling approaches to social networks, uh, please let us know and we can uh, try and put those training materials um, together.